I realize that um, the message today is actually a great youth and uh, maybe millennial uh, message full of reference for, for those folks. And if that's not you, even, if, even the analogy today will be educational. Hang in there with me. Harry Potter published in what year do you think? Take a guess, folks. Jenny, you know this? I know. <laughs> what year? 1998. Yes, I actually had a date from, I don't know where this was, I found this. Um, it was in, I saw it in 97. So it may have been written in 90. I think it was written. Seven? Yeah, it's the 20th anniversary of this year. So, <laughs> so think of this. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with, check Wikipedia. Um, but think about this, anyone that was born during that year is either 20 or 21 years of age, alright? So now as I'm talking about this, you're thinking like, some of you are thinking, oh my goodness, this is way too fresh and new. Actually, it's, it's not. Even Harry Potter is very dated. So, if you're feeling like this is old, it's because you are super old. <laughs> Congratulations. Soon enough, I'm going to be in that category, and there's going to be something else that a preacher is, is using as an analogy. I'm going to be like, why is this guy using these newfangled references? So, it's been a while. Now, maybe you'd say, well, how about the movie then? What about the movie? What, what year do you think the movie, The Sorcerer's Stone, the first one, was 2001. Now, so if you think about that, the folks that have been watching that one even, guess what? In the sweet spot is like between the 30s and 40s now for Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Mm -hmm. That blows my mind. You know, I'm right on the upper edge of that, and I can remember secretly watching Harry Potter because it was considered to be fairly evil by many people in the evangelical world. It still exists today. People do not, there are some that really find it offensive. But I'll say this as I reference it today. It's great to see that there has not been a great rise in witches and wizards in the United States over those many, many years. Now some of you might think that that's a joke, but that's actually sincere. When I was a young man, um, so you guys hopefully say, well, you still are, hopefully you say that. But, um, I look in the mirror and I, I'm kind of not feeling that anymore. Um, but that was a real thing. Witchcraft was a real thing. And so that was an actual real fear then. One of my favorite characters is Neville Longbottom. A misfit among misfits. He was genuine, honest, honorable and brave and the story doesn't focus on him but his story is great one of the things that happens to him is he gets a little ball in the mail one day and it's called a remember and he says the most beautiful quote and it's supposed to turn red smokes turns red in the ball when you have forgotten something and he says but i can't remember what I've forgotten. The message of today's sermon, I can't remember, can't remember what I've forgotten. Now, James's letter, you're gonna say, is far off of this. Where are you going with this, Rick? I'll get there, trust me. James's letter seems to have been written to circulate among various churches and areas. Very unlike things like Corinthians or Ephesians written to a specific church. I'm going to tell you a little bit of this background about James because over the next five weeks, potentially, we're going to be staying in the book of James. And this will be the theme. Our discussions will revolve around James's themes. He writes concisely, lots of short statements of truth, maxims, as you may call them, and it makes it memorable. And in fact, I would bet you that if I read you some of the things in James, you would say, oh yeah, I remember that. 
Maybe you didn't remember that it was in James. Listen to the introduction of the book. If you're a Bible reader or that you're going to be, if you are reading the Bible currently, this stuff is going to become so familiar to you. James, a servant of God in the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes of the dispersion, greetings. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face any kind of trials, trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be, be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Is that familiar to anybody? Does that sound right? If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly that will be given to you. But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter, being double-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. You'll remember other statements, like faith without works is dead. And the book of James focuses so much on works that it scares people. It scares Christians who are good Pauline theologians even, like Martin Luther, who had a problem with the book of James because it could easily be corrupted into making one think that they can work their way to heaven. But James never says that. James presents works and doing things as a result of becoming a follower of Christ. It's a result of seeing who you are in Christ that leads you to the doing. But James pushes hard. And he says that if you're not doing, something is wrong, my paraphrase. And we can look at ourselves today. We can look in the mirror today. James talks about a mirror that was just read. I wish, this is my greatest wish, that I had enough time this morning to take an extra 10 to 15 minutes where you get to reread this scripture all by yourself five to ten times, and to internalize the words. Because to be quite honest with you, there's nothing that I'm going to say to you today that's going to speak to you with more depth than what James does in this scripture. And so hopefully you can take that and go home with that thought and sit down for 10 to 15 minutes and reread and think about the theme Plug in different ideas and thoughts that you pull out and then go back and, and start with that idea from the beginning. And I'll tell you that when I did that, when I sat down with this piece of scripture for 10 minutes, it was blowing my mind. It was so beautiful to see the writing of James. He says, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. In his introduction. And that's a great start to the tone of the entire book and to this series. We need to focus as a church, as individuals, not just on coming to Christ, but growing in Christ, being mature, and lacking nothing. Fill in the holes, find the weak spots, become strengthened. And strong. James's tone is obviously very serious, and he starts out by telling you who he's writing to, and it's to Jewish people, possibly even non-religious Jewish people. And he wants to tell them something very specific because they're missing something. They think that they're following the law, and they know what true religion is, he says. But he says, You've missed it. True religion is this. James' letter agrees with Paul over and over again, really, that we are saved by grace alone, but faith without works is dead. This section of Scripture, though, addresses a forgetful follower 
The one who sees and hears and walks away forgetting. Do you remember that in the scripture? He, talk, he talks about that as his analogy. They look at themselves, walk away, and forget who or what they are. I wish that I could take more time, and we don't have it. So take it with you today. Now, I'm just going to do a quick commentary on some things, and I'm going to give you a conclusion. I'm going to read this again, just one more time. That's my, that's my compromise. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from where? Above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of His own purpose, He gave us birth by the word of truth. Now focus, think about word in this scripture that continue. Word is a theme. Word of truth. He gave us birth by the word of truth so that we may be kind, become his kind of first fruits. We're his first fruits. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Let everyone be what? What? Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's a great emphasis right there. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness. And welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your soul. Do you have something implanted in you already this morning? I believe you do. God's giving you something. It's a part of you. And when you look in the mirror, you're going to see it. But, he says in verse 22, be doers of the word and not merely hearers only. So you're starting to see here a pattern. He's talking about looking, looking into the word, seeing, right? Hearing. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look in the mirror. For they look at themselves on go and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into what? Those who look into the perfect law, which is what? What do you think the perfect law is? The word of God. The law of liberty. What do you think the law of liberty could be? Freedom. Freedom in Christ. The law of liberty would be Jesus, the gospel. And if they persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious. This is really his concluding statement for this section. If any think they are religious. There's a hot word for our culture today. Religious in evangelical circles for sure is a hot button topic. People will fight over whether or not Christianity is a religion. I'll do a poll. Is Christianity a religion? Raise your hand if you think it is. How many? Raise your hand if you're not sure if you would consider it. Raise your hand if you definitely do not believe that it's a religion. A little bit of certainty from a couple of people. Those people will tell you, no, Christianity is a relationship. It's a relationship with Jesus. It's not about a set of do's and don'ts. It's a living, breathing thing. Well, I got bad news for you folks. There's a pure religion listed by James here. Really, James is making a point, though, isn't he? He's not saying that following Christ is a religion. He's speaking to those people that think that their religion is everything. He says, what's he say? If you think, if any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is 
this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So two elements of that, right? Two elements. To care for people that need you. Now culturally, to care for orphans and widows in that culture would have been huge. That would have been a primary responsibility of the people in that culture. Now, things are a little different in our country. We have a welfare system set up. We don't even as Christians think in those terms. How many of you would consider the mission of the church to care for orphans and widows? Right? It's, it's not. Now some churches do believe that that's their calling and that's their big ministry and that's how they glorify the Lord and that's fine. In this culture though, definitely big. And James saw the lack of care and he called them out. And he says to keep oneself from being stained. Now, okay. There's so much there that I don't get to talk about this morning. He's calling out those who think they have it all together. He's clarifying what religion should be to care for those who can't care for themselves. I'm going to emphasize again. He wants you to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Those words, quick to listen, slow, slow, slow to speak and slow to anger. This convicted me. This convicted me personally. He says to welcome with meekness the implanted word. Implanted. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. Are you awake with me still, church? Here's what troubles me. How do you undo self-deception? This is troubling. How do I undo my own self-deception? Do I think I have it all together and that I know what true religion is? And I'm following the way that Jesus actually intended me to follow? And I know that I'm doing X, Y, and Z the right way? And those other people, they've got it wrong. How do we undo self-deception? So, here's my commentary, my preaching, my proclamation that's sort of like looking at the Word and then commenting. I don't know that I have the answer. We are all vulnerable to self-deception. But my advice is this. Look into your spiritual or life mirror and do it often. Often. The mirror, as we talked about in the children's sermon, is what? The Word. The Law. Jesus Himself, in fact. Look often. Think about the words slow to speak and slow to anger, it almost sounds like we're supposed to slow down. And even though it says quick to listen, when you're listening, you're just kind of receiving, aren't you? So I would equate that with one word. I'm going to call that
and reflecting on who you are in Christ, like Nan and James and Justin are in Him, and they see Christ in them. They know who they are, that they're, child's God, they're God's child. When you, that introduction that James gave us, he says that you have the implanted word in you. When you look at yourself and you see Christ and you're sitting and looking at Christ and you're spending time with Christ and you're reflecting in Him, you're doing something productive. I would say do it often. It's no coincidence that the word reflection is so fitting. We have to take the time to think deeply, study ourselves and the Word, and remember what we forgot. We can remember what we forgot. We go to the Word. We go to Jesus. This whole section speaks to this. We are His, His first fruits. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. James has challenged us to use our sense of sight and sound and our discipline to reflect. Reflect on who you are, both good and bad. He talks in two places about keeping ourselves unstained. Reflect on the words you hear. Reflect on the law of liberty, the gospel. And that will lead you to do what? What will those things lead you to do? It will lead you to reflect. It will lead you to doing. And when you're doing, you are reflecting not yourself, but God. We are hearers, we are seers, we see who we are in Christ. But if we don't move on and get busy doing, we go back to the mirror and we never reflect who he is. So to go back to the mirror of what Eris said in the short sermon, when we are reflecting, we should be able to stand in front of a mirror of Eris said and see that our desire is actually Christ's desire. When you look into your spiritual mirror, if you don't see a doer, slow down and reflect. And then you'll begin to reflect him to others. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the book of James. Thank you for the challenge. Lord, if it were only to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, Father, we can all be challenged. Lord, help us to follow your word. Help us to see who we truly are in you and be diverse.